This is California after a brutal five-year drought. Historic rains pounded the thirsty state in 2017 and left record snowpack in the Sierra Nevada mountains. You would think after such a crisis, where the governor signed emergency executive orders to restrict water use and pass new laws to regulate California's dwindling groundwater reserves, that we'd be doing something, anything, to grab the bounty of water that fell on this parched state. But instead, millions of acre feet of high quality, fresh water was allowed to wash right out to sea. In just the first three months of 2017, enough water to fill Millerton Lake 60 times went right into California's sprawling delta and under the Golden Gate Bridge. So how did we get here? How did a state with nearly 40 million people in it, with the most fertile and productive agricultural land in the world, that was literally in panic mode over five dry years, not do everything it could to capture, store, and make the most out of this precious resource as it fell in abundance all winter long. Like most complex issues, the answer isn't simple or easy. But at the core, it comes down to a fairly basic divide. A divide between those in power in Sacramento and an entire industry that is dying without water. The rest of us don't really pay attention to the water war that rages around us in California. As long as our yards stay green, the tap flows when we turn it on, and food at the store is plentiful and cheap, why should we care? This is why. We allowed 10 trillion gallons of water to wash away while still technically in a severe drought. This is a battle, plain and simple between a powerful movement to protect the environment at all costs and the ability of a nation to continue to grow its own food source. The real trick is finding a way to do both. Either way, it's time for the people of California to wake up. Production funding for this program has been provided by the Myers Farms Family Trust, bringing awareness to the consumer of the responsible agricultural practices performed by farmers in the fertile fields of the San Joaquin Valley, preserving the world's food supply and natural habitats for the generations yet to come. We are proud to support quality educational programs like Tapped Out and Valley's Gold, only available on Valley PBS. In 2016, things did not look good for California. Five years of extreme drought had taken its toll on the state. Hardest hit by far, the California farmer. With lakes at historic low levels, environmental regulations limiting the flow of what surface water there was, and desperate overpumping of groundwater reserves to keep crops alive, the state's agricultural industry was fighting for its life. When we didn't get the, the allocation in the last three years, uh, we pumped a lot of groundwater and we had to shut off a lot of wells because there was no water in them. Wells that had been producing uh, in the 
from the 50s on, producing real good water. But this last year, we had to shut off wells. But something also happened as a result of the drought. For the first time, the lack of water in California hit the average person right where they live. Today, I'm declaring a drought emergency in the state of California. It's important to awaken all Californians to the serious matter of drought and the lack of rain. Uh, we are in a uh, unprecedented, very serious situation, and people should uh, uh, pause and reflect on how dependent we are on the rain, on nature, and one another. Mandatory restrictions on urban water use got people's attention. Lawns turned brown. In some rural cities, water dried up completely or was too contaminated to drink. And some in California looked up from their lives and asked, are we okay? Right now, we have a drought emergency and a flood emergency at the same time in California. And Governor Brown's... uh, When he came out with his uh, drought emergency deal and to make conservation a way of life, um, it kind of changed the whole thing. Our our water systems in California, some of it's ran by the state, some of it's ran by the feds. And what's really killed us along with the drought was having two administrations on the same page that were really both anti-ag at the same time. It's just been a perfect storm. There isn't one easy way to explain California's water crisis. It's a tangled mess of issues, politics, power, and a complete reliance on whatever Mother Nature wants to do. But if you quiet most of the background noise and focus on the core moving parts, understanding California's water crisis becomes something we all can and should do. To fully grasp where we are today, you need to go back in time to see what the San Joaquin Valley looked like 200 years ago. My name is Jay Randall McFarland, and I'm a water historian in the San Joaquin Valley. The San Joaquin Valley was a real big, empty place. And uh, it was often mistaken for a desert, but it really wasn't. It was a native grassland, and along the rivers there were uh, trees, forests, a lot of oak trees in some areas, but a lot of empty land. Between San Joaquin and Kings River, there was not a tree. It was all empty land. Under natural conditions, the rain that fell over these empty plains just would soak in and there was no place for it to go. The ground was uneven. It maybe formed some pools, but it wasn't around very long. It soon dried up. And uh, the grasslands that sprouted with the rains were usually gone, completely gone by July and August. They were grazed over by the wildlife and it was just too hot. They baked away to practically nothing. It was empty, bare earth. And that's why so many folks thought it was a desert, but it really wasn't. So in the summer, you would have come out of a dry period. And as you came into the fall and winter and the rain started to fall, there would have been this network of wetlands and rivers that would have begun to fill fill with water. and throughout the winter, those areas would continue to fill until you know, large parts of the Central Valley would have looked like a vast inland sea. The four rivers that flow into the old Tulare Lake bed were all terminal rivers. In other words, they ended in a lake, but could not, under most circumstances, flow to the ocean. And those were the Kings, the Cahuilla, the Tule, and the Kern rivers. And those four rivers were what kept Tulare Lake filled, and it was the largest freshwater lake in the western United States, even larger in uh, total size than the Great Salt Lake in Utah. After the discovery of gold in 1849, another kind of flood hit California. 
thousands headed west to stake their claims on hope and a better life. The gold rush brought most of the action here in the mid-1800s, and with it, thousands more came to support that effort. If you have an army of people flocking to one place to mine for gold, you have others that know those people need to be fed. So agriculture has been a key part of the San Joaquin Valley's economy since, really since the area was settled by American and European settlers in the late 19th century. And initially, the very early irrigation systems that were developed, because the summers here are always dry, so you need irrigation in order to, to really grow crops here. Initially, that would happen in some of the areas on the east side where there are local rivers, and folks develop some simple ways of capturing that some of those flows in the spring and using it for irrigation. The first settlers who came to the San Joaquin Valley and looking for new lives and new homes were really products of the gold rush. They had come here to chase gold and make their fortune. Well, most didn't, of course, but they found that California was a pretty good place to live, and many concluded that the San Joaquin Valley floor might be made into a very productive farming land, although there certainly was nothing at that time to indicate that that was true. It was dry, dusty, miserable, but they're the ones who built the very first canals and for the most part they were built either small diversions out of, out of streams, they were dug with pick and shovels, they were small, and it wasn't until the 1870s that the first large canals throughout most of this area started to be built. At the same time Tulare Lake was slowly drying up and becoming fertile farmland, another chain of events was beginning that would shape water issues well into the next century. A German immigrant named Henry Miller set up a shop as a butcher in San Francisco in 1853, working to help feed the flood of gold seekers arriving in California by the thousands. is a great part of California history. When the gold rush was taking place, a couple of guys came out, Miller and Lux, and they figured out, you know, better than looking for gold was to sell the gold miners uh, equipment and uh, ultimately beef. Okay, these guys were originally from, uh, I believe, the Chicago area, and they were butchers. They had a shop in San Francisco, and they decided to raise their own cattle. Uh, they came down here, and uh, boy, these guys had ground from here uh, all the way up and down the state. After making a name for himself in San Francisco as a butcher and supplier of meat to hungry gold miners, Henry Miller teamed up with a former competitor, Charles Lux, with a basic plan, to raise their own beef to supply their growing operation in San Francisco. Both hardworking, shrewd businessmen, Miller and Lux began to buy all the land they could in Central California. Their cattle business grew rapidly, and it wasn't long before they were the top supplier of beef in California, along with becoming one of the largest landowners in the United States, with 1.4 million acres under their control. The ranch headquarters was in Los Banos, California, and still stands today at the site of España's Mexican restaurant originally called the Canal Farm Inn. Miller was instrumental in the early development of gravity-based irrigation systems to maximize his cattle empire. Because Miller and Lux owned such large amounts of land in the Central Valley, much of it with prime water rights along the San Joaquin River, they played a big role in the evolution of water rights law as the Central Valley grew and agriculture expanded. The story goes that uh, Henry Miller 
was able to claim uh, that land as swamp and overflow land. And all you had to do was prove that you'd gone over in a boat, and he did. Boat was on a wagon being pulled by horses, but he did go over it in a boat. And so uh, he got all that land out there, and in so doing, he made sure it was right along the river. Well, Henry Miller and the firm of Miller and Lux was the same company which was the winner in establishing riparian rights, that water going past a property is, uh, that's a property right right there and you, nobody can diminish that flow. Well, they had miles and miles and miles of riparian land. And so with that, Miller and Lux came to control much of the Kern River and also particularly the San Joaquin River. And uh, that was in complete contrast to the other type of water right, which was uh, prior appropriation, first in time, first in right. They were just completely opposite to each other. That was something that wasn't really worked out until 1928. You can imagine all the disputes that went on along the way. Prior to pre-1914 in the state, when the state actually got engaged and divvied up uh, more of the rights, they established riparian rights, senior rights throughout California. So uh, the whole uh, basis of water rights in, in a great part.
uh, Southern Pacific Company, Chevron, uh, other large landowners in the region who at the time were leasing their properties for grazing rights and what have you, and they get about $5 an acre. Giffen figured out, if I can get a long-term lease, uh, I can get uh, the pump company to put the well in, and they'll let me pay it over time. And that long-term lease, he provided Chevron and others a crop share. So they would get 10% of the crop proceeds from, say, growing cotton. So that $5 rent would go to 50 So he put together the leases. He got the guys to essentially carry them on the wells, and he built a 125,000-acre operation again, prior to the Central Valley Project being here. Groundwater pumping opened up the entire San Joaquin Valley to agriculture. There were no dams or reservoirs yet to hold water and control floods and canal systems were fairly crude by today's standards. Once the spring snow runoff was gone, the ability to pump water during the dry summer months meant farmers could extend their season, grow more crops, and expand the amounts of food and fiber sources like cotton to the nation. But the massive underground aquifers that held millions of acre feet of water just below the surface drained quickly. And in some places around the valley, the ground would literally collapse and sink, an effect called subsidence. From 1937 to 1955, the ground sank 28 feet in Mendota, California. This didn't go unnoticed by the farmers who are standing next to poles that are elevated and, and, and the ground is way down here. And uh, pumps that are pushed up out of the ground and infrastructure that twists as a result of the subsidence, just huge problems from subsidence. As conceived, the Central Valley Project's initial features that were designed by the state of California in the 1920s were almost identical as to what was built by the federal government in the Central Valley Project's initial phases in the 1930s and 40s. With groundwater reserves running low in the 1920s and land sinking all over the San Joaquin Valley as a result, a group of farmers approached the state of California with a plan to build an infrastructure project to capture water behind two dams and deliver the water through a series of canals to areas where groundwater was getting low or had dried up entirely. Places that had rich soils for growing crops but little to no water during dry spells. These two dams would also provide much needed flood protection from heavy rain years. As populations grew in the valley, controlling water upriver of major cities was another big part of this plan. Lastly, these large reservoirs would hold water that could be used in periods of drought that were, as they are now, completely unpredictable and devastating to crops, livestock, and people that were continuing to pour into California. Water could also be sent back to farmlands where the fields would be flooded and groundwater would be recharged. So prior to the Central Valley Project, when people were really relying just on groundwater, the groundwater out here has some salts and minerals in it, and you can't grow every crop with the, with the native groundwater. So with the introduction of surface water coming from Northern California and the Delta, that water is of a higher quality. So suddenly you could grow crops like 
almonds that are a little more sensitive or vegetable crops and iceberg lettuce. And it, it just opened up the area from being a region that was primarily uh, barley and grains, cotton, melons, to suddenly almonds, pistachios, uh, lettuce, uh, all kinds of different vegetables, lots of processing tomatoes. It totally allowed for a much greater diversification of the crop profile out here. And the area just flourished. Friant Division of the Central Valley Project was conceived by the state. It was designed and eventually built by the federal government because the state couldn't sell the bonds. It was built in order to bring water to a land where groundwater had been exhausted. And it was recognized by the planners in the Bureau of Reclamation after the federal government took it over that had the project not been built and become operational in the 1940s, within 20 years, that would have been by the mid-1960s, 500,000 acres of farmland in what's now the Friant Division would have been fallowed for lack of water. There are only one million acres in the Friant Division. That would have been half of it could not have been farmed because there was no, no groundwater. The uh, idea of building a dam here was the solution. The problem was is that the water rights that existed for the San Joaquin River belonged to others on the other side of the valley. Uh, and, and those were rights that belonged to basically two butchers from San Francisco, uh, Miller and Lux. Uh, ultimately, they were sold to what is now known as the San Joaquin River Exchange Contractors, which are four basic water districts on the west side. Uh, all, the government had to enter into what was called an exchange contract, which means that they would receive their water uh, from the Delta via Shasta Dam, the Federal Pumping Station, and the Delta Mendota Canal in lieu, Friant, or the contractors on the east side uh, from Chowchilla all the way to Bakersfield would be able to use the Friant water. And so that's the way it's worked for years. The Central Valley Project was the first of two major water projects that California built to handle the water demands of population growth and agriculture. This is the cornerstone of the project, Friant Dam at Millerton Lake. Here is how the CVP was designed and built. The state originally drew up the plans for the project, but could not raise the money to build it. Then the Great Depression struck in 1929 and made matters much worse. So the federal government took the project on and continued with much of the original design. Friant Dam would be built on the San Joaquin River, creating Millerton Lake. Then the Friant Kern Canal and Madera Canal would be built originating from either side of the dam. The Friant Kern Canal would deliver water 155 miles south along the thirsty eastern edge of the San Joaquin Valley, ending in Bakersfield, replenishing crops and groundwater levels along the way. But here was the catch. The feds needed permission to build the Friant unit from those who had senior water rights along the San Joaquin River since they would be taking the water from rights holders that depended on it and shipping it south, they had to come up with an option the four major water districts along the San Joaquin would go for. So the plan to build another dam at Shasta in far northern California and release its waters into the Sacramento River Delta was offered. The federal government basically promised to exchange the water rights on the San Joaquin for water delivered from Shasta through the Delta and into the Delta-Mendota Canal for delivery. California's massive Delta system is a key part of understanding how water moves and works in the state. It's where most of the state's large rivers terminate, creating an enormous network of waterways and marshes that lead to the San Francisco Bay. Once the Shasta water hit the Delta, it would have to be pumped up to the new Delta Medota Canal and then back down to the San Joaquin where senior water rights holders would draw on it for agriculture. 
Before we talk about Fryan Dam and its development, we ought to look back even further because there were many dams built on the San Joaquin River and its tributaries in the decades before Fryan Dam was constructed. And those were hydroelectric facilities. Hydroelectric power development was really, truly developed to a level never before seen anywhere in the world until it came to the San Joaquin River. First with the Crane Valley system, which led to the construction of what we know as Bass Lake, and then the much bigger Big Creek hydroelectric system, which is developed and now operated by Southern California Edison Company. Those dams had already established water storage as a fact of life on the San Joaquin River before Fryant Dam came along. Southern California Edison Company ran into problems with Miller and Lux in the 1920s uh, over the plan to dam the San Joaquin River. Ultimately, uh, legal action was averted for the most part in that case because Miller and Lux recognized that just as farmers do today, the value of water storage. That if there is somebody up in the mountains with a dam that's holding some of the water back, it isn't all gonna flow down past the uh, intakes to the canals on the far west side of the valley where Miller and Lux farmed uh, all in the springtime. It could be measured out during the year. And of course, in that case, to generate power uh, for Southern California Edison. It was a system that worked very well, still does today. My name is Dwayne Straup. I am the Deputy Area Manager for the Bureau of Reclamation, South Central California Area Office. Bryant Dam is part of the Central Valley Project and it was constructed to provide water on the east side of the San Joaquin Valley, so all the way from Chowchilla to Bakersfield. total of about 190 miles of land that can get water now that we've built Fryant Dam. Uh, it diverts water on the San Joaquin River, comes down from the Sierras, sends it 39 miles north on the Madera Canal and 152 miles south in the Fryant Kern Canal. Bryant Dam's construction was planned through the 1930s and the federal government took it over, took the entire project over in the late 1930s. The ground was broken at Fryant Dam in 1939 and it is amazing how fast the project went. Considering the fact that World War II broke out in 1941, the dam was essentially finished in 1942 and the finishing touches were all in place by basically by 1945 except for the for the spillway gates it was a huge job and this was a time when uh, jobs were really welcomed it meant a lot to the valley and getting the valley out of the Great Depression that occurred. And along with that then, as the dam was built, an equally big job was constructing the two canals, the Madera Canal to the north in the Madera County and the Fryant Kern Canal, which runs 153 miles to the Kern River in Bakersfield. 
Those were huge projects that, uh, in some cases, in the Fry and Kearns case, took several years to complete. Fry Dam was constructed in 1940 to 1942 while World War II was going on. It is a gravity dam, concrete gravity dam. So what that means is that it is just the mass of the dam that is holding back the water. It's just massive, massive amounts of concrete poured down. We dig down to bedrock, we expose bedrock, we get down to nice hard rock and then we put concrete on it so that it's adhered really close to the bedrock, start building the dam up, and then it's just the massive amount of concrete that holds back the water that's held back by the dam. Uh, Friant Dam is possibly smaller than it was intended to be because during World War II there was a shortage of steel. I was at Friant Dam when they had the big celebration, when they turned the water into the Frank Kern Canal. I was here uh, when the water first went past Main Street and Orange Cove. Big celebration. Had a big uh, lottery. You picked a time when the water was gonna cross the street, <laughs> under the street, and Whoever won, I don't remember what they won, but they won a prize if they picked the right time. And after that, there was good many years, Orange Cove had a water festival at that same time a year, uh, celebrating the arrival of surface water. What, what happens is that the uh project begins delivering water in 1949 and over time what changes in this valley is that the groundwater levels change significantly going up and and essentially stop the subsidence that was occurring in the valley so so the primary objective was accomplished uh, in addition to uh, generating you know billions of dollars in terms of agriculture so it was a perfect project for the Bureau of Reclamation it was a perfect project for the state of California and, and that's the way it was for 60 plus years. This year is a really wet year um, we have a massive amount of snowpack and snowpack is measured by uh, various uh, agencies two of which is Department of Water Resources and the National uh, Weather Service. So they estimate how much snow is upstream and then they come into a snow water equivalent and they forecast how much water is going to come down the San Joaquin River. So this year it's dry, it's not raining, but we're still releasing 8,000 CFS. We're trying to bring the reservoir level down because we're expecting a very large runoff in May and June. So we want to be able to have as much space available as possible to attenuate those higher flows later. Part of what this dam does is provide flood protection downstream. If this dam wasn't here, when those large flows would happen, those large flows would go all the way to the delta. So everything between here and the delta would be at higher risk for flood damage. In January of 1997, the flood protection that Fryant Dam provides was put to the test. An unprecedented chain of events led to a massive flood in the watershed above Millerton Lake. Heavy snowpack in the high country of the Sierra Nevada mountains met a rare series of storms known as a Pineapple Express. This intense plume of subtropical moisture brought with it historically warm temperatures and unheard of high snow levels. Torrential rains fell directly on snow up to 10,000 feet, instantly liquefying it and sending it rushing into the first lake on the San Joaquin Mammoth Pool Reservoir. The dam at Mammoth Pool is operated by Southern California Edison, charged with generating hydroelectric power for its customers. But as the first dam in a chain of lakes including Redinger Lake and Kirkhoff Reservoir, both above Fryant Dam, they were in constant communication with Fryant the night of January 2nd as Mammoth Pool rose at levels never before seen. 
dam managers at Mammoth Pool advised the Bureau of Reclamation team that runs Friant Dam to begin releasing water at high levels to make room for what was coming. Once a lake has water go over its spillway, it's lost control of that release, and data from meters set all over the rivers running into Mammoth foretold a massive spill was coming. The people running Friant Dam that night began releasing water from the bottom of the dam, but not at a volume that could drop the lake level fast enough. A broken sensor upstream and an understandable amount of disbelief at how much water was coming down into Mammoth slowed the releases in Millerton Lake. Around two o'clock in the morning, dam managers at Mammoth Pool notified Friant Dam that they had lost control of the water and were spilling at record levels. The clock was now ticking as a surge of millions of gallons of water roared down the San Joaquin, inundating Redinger Lake, Kirkhoff Reservoir, and hitting Millerton Lake in the early morning hours. Millerton rapidly filled to its brim and, with all four tubes at the bottom of the dam at high release, spilled at record levels, causing havoc in the town of Friant and flooding communities down the San Joaquin River. So would another dam on the San Joaquin have made a difference? In heavy rain runoff years like 1997 and 2017, having another dam above Millerton Lake would provide another capture and control point for the massive flows coming down from the Sierra. Back in January, we looked at the inflow forecast and it said that we were gonna get a bunch of water. And so we started releasing water. We started releasing at 5,000 CFS to try and release water before the big flows got there. And then the reservoir went all the way up to over 450,000 acre feet, which is quite a lot of water that it gained due to storms in January. And then we had more storms in February where we had to release water. Uh, we're targeting about 220,000 acre feet in the reservoir for the end of March. And then we want to maintain about that much through April. And then in May, right before we expect the runoff to occur, we'll try and pull the reservoir down more so that we get it down to where we can still make releases to the Friant Kern Canal, but as low as possible and still being able to make those releases because we expect to get over a million acre feet, well over a million acre feet in the April through July runoff this year. Well over a million acre feet of runoff water. Water has been releasing at flood stage from Friant Dam for the first four months of 2017 to make room for well over a million acre feet of water forecast to melt and come down the San Joaquin. But if there was another reservoir above Millerton that could hold that well over a million acre feet of water, wouldn't that be a good thing? In a state that suffers regular periods of drought, shouldn't we be building more water storage instead of literally wasting trillions of gallons of it in wet years? For those working to get the Temperance Flat Dam project built, that question is at the core of their mission. The challenge that we have at this dam is that it's too small for the type of runoff that occurs on an annual basis. In other words, this dam only holds about a half a million acre feet, yet the runoff annually is about 1.8 million. So this dam has to be exercised at least four times, resulting in several occasions where it has to make flood releases much like it's doing today. And what happens is that 50% uh, of those times, in, um, the, an excess of one point uh, million acre feet get released to the ocean. Uh, and so that prevents us from being able to use that water in a more beneficial way, either to the cities, the farms, and or for recharging. Uh, the problem is, is that we can't manage that, that water unless we have a bigger cup. After 30 years of overgrowing forests and failure to ma properly manage the forest so they reach that, uh, that healthy forestation level so, that the, so we can actually have water that sheds into our streams, fills up our reservoirs, 
and replenishes groundwater at the same time. All of our water comes from those mountains and that's our pump. In the valley, uh, the, the water that we pump out of the ground actually started in the hills. And so it's necessary that that process continue in order to replenish that. So, but, but fast forward to this situation now where after decades of overgrowing forests, and now we decide to remove that surface water delivery. So we've got two problems developing here. We've got the, the lack of water shedding into our, our uh, aquifers and into our streams and our reservoirs, and a lack of surface water delivery, the water that's been now taken away from farming operations. So they completely depend on groundwater. So not only are we pumping groundwater, we're pumping it at, at, at an inordinate rate. 20% uh, of the state's electricity supply is, de is dedicated every year to groundwater pumping. Well, that went exponential over the last few years of drought because we were completely dependent on groundwater pumping and our surface water delivery was completely curtailed, 100%. So we're, we're absolutely sucking water out of the ground faster than it can replenish uh, than, it, than it's ever happened and the ground begins to sink and the state wonders why. This recent drought that we've lived through has been, I think in many ways, a wake up call for people because it's been very hot also. So it's been much more like the kind of droughts we know are more likely in the future. Today, uh, in an effort to uh, take advantage of these high runoff periods, a project named Temperance Flat uh, is being considered at this site, which would increase capacity by 1.2 million acre feet. If constructed, Temperance Flat Dam would be built at the back of Millerton Lake, in a narrow canyon creating a new lake, that would more than double the size of Millerton's capacity. The dam would be massive. The proposed design calls for a concrete gravity arch dam similar in size and scale to the mighty Hoover Dam on the Colorado River. The design for the system and the solution for the system to be saved is there. And it's in Temperance Flat Dam. Because every year for the last 30 years, historically on an average. For flood releases alone, we released 500,000 acre feet of water. That over the last 30 years is the equivalent of a river from sea to shining sea, 300 feet wide and 160 foot deep. Now that's bigger than any river I know. And that's a, a, enough water to sustain our groundwater supply. That would have brought the groundwater up significantly. So we, we're, we're letting our future flow out to the ocean. We're letting jobs flow out to the ocean. These are agriculture jobs. These are uh, uh, communities that are disadvantaged, that are becoming dis disadvantaged even more as a result of the loss of this water that's so precious to our system. Now let's talk about water storage. You know, NRDC is not dogmatic about storage. We actually believe that you should evaluate projects based on their merits. Now when you look at a project like Temperance Flat, um, we looked at it very carefully and ultimately we strongly oppose that project for both economic and environmental concerns. Even though there is, you know, a year like this when you have water spilling from Millerton and the other 15 to 20 reservoirs upstream of it, um, those years don't come around that frequently. And so that's why the Bureau of Reclamation estimated that even though the storage capacity of the reservoir is 1.5 million acre feet, the annual yield, the annual water supply from that project is only 70,000 acre feet. And so that means you're spending two to three billion dollars on a project that yields 70,000 acre feet of water. And from the environmental perspective, it actually worsens conditions for salmon downstream as part of our restoration program. I think a great illustration of how broken the system is and how we manage water 
You know, we've just come off of uh, four to five years of drought in the state. There's been a lot of overdrafting. Uh, part of the consequence of that, we actually, the governor signed legislation to regulate pumping. Uh, we're so concerned about recharge and, and uh, the overdrafting of these aquifers. So here we have a winter where it rains like crazy. It's one of California's wettest winters of record. We've allowed uh, about one and a half times the amount of Lake Powell to flow uh, during a period of need out under the Golden Gate Bridge. And we could have taken that water and put it into the projects. We already have the canals and systems in place to distribute it throughout the Central Valley. I don't know why the state, uh, with all the focus and all the desire to recharge our aquifer, why we can't have access to some of that water that's God-given. It didn't cost the state anything. We have the projects in place. This year I have six to 7,000 acres that are fallowed that we could be putting berms around and simply putting water and recharging the aquifer. But unfortunately, between the state and the federal government uh, and the water district, the cost of that water is too great for us to purchase to put in the ground. The state should, and the federal government should have programs to simply encourage growers to sink it in the ground. Even if they charged a nominal fee, we would get vastly more water in the ground, and that's got to be better than allowing it to flow under the Golden Gate Bridge. If water storage in California has always been a main component of the state's water infrastructure, why isn't it a good idea to expand it now? To have it grow with the demands of increased population and agricultural support? Why is there a fight over a project like Temperance Flat Dam? Why is it perfectly fine to lawmakers and leadership in Sacramento to let millions of acre feet of water wash out to sea while the state is in the middle of a drought crisis and residents are being forced to conserve water. In part two of Tapped Out, we'll dive into the birth of the environmental revolution in California. And while protections for the environment were necessary as the state's water system grew, a lot of people say these efforts have gone too far and are now out of balance with protecting water use for people and the ability for agriculture to survive. Smaller family farms, they won't be able to keep up with this stuff. They won't even be able to afford the fines. As an agribusinessman in Central California, what I see is the agenda of the elite far left environmental groups is to try to restore back to where California was, you know, 30 years ago when we had a population of 15 million. Now we have a population approaching 40 million and the horses left the barn. We cannot go back to where it was. It will never go back to where it was. They would like for it to be that way, but it's just not going to happen. What are we going to do as a nation when we don't have the food supply for the entire United States. Our nation's security is at risk if we allow another nation to grow our basic needs and necessities. Besides that, it can't be done like it's done here. Storage becomes almost religious in California debates over water and depending upon which tribe you're in, whether you're part of the environmental tribe or the agricultural tribe, there's this political pressure to kind of come along and join with your tribe's position. I, I don't understand why there has to be, you have to be pro-environment or ag. You know, I just, I just don't buy that argument. People in Sacramento and the Bay Area must know that they're just simply driving us out of business. And it's hard to contemplate for what good. And uh, quite frankly, I, I, I think if you were in our region, you would think uh, there are members of this state uh, that, uh, quite frankly, don't think they need Central Valley agriculture.
Production funding for this program has been provided by the Myers Farms Family Trust, bringing awareness to the consumer of the responsible agricultural practices performed by farmers in the fertile fields of the San Joaquin Valley, preserving the world's food supply and natural habitats for the generations yet to come. We are proud to support quality educational programs like Tapped Out and Valley's Gold, only available on Valley PBS.